So the Robert E. Lee statue, when it's unveiled, it's the, f the final of the four to be unveiled in 1924. There's a whole series of urban performances that are associated with the unveiling of the monument. And so in the same week that the Robert E. Lee monument is unveiled, First Presbyterian Church, which is on that square, which looks at the unveiled monument, uh, the minister of that church includes in one of his uh, sermons a description of the social life of the South before and during the, the social life of the South, before and during the war with all that made it ideal and charming, right? So the life of the South is now represented as ideal and charming. This is the 12th or 13th iteration of a tour that started this past summer. And I've named the tour Race and Place. And the tour comes from the place where, um, obviously we've been talking about race in Charlottesville in really sort of acute ways over the last 18 months. Uh, and I came quickly to realize that uh, many of my white Christian uh, friends were largely unaware of the history of racism and how it actually has profoundly shaped the city of Charlottesville over the last 200 years. And so it's not that many of my um, uh, uh, white friends were, uh, you know, sort of rejected certain dimensions of history. They just really were unaware. There was just a, a, a lack of knowledge. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the law and the prophets. If we in fact want to be a people of the truth, we have to be able to speak the truth. And if we're going to move ever towards reconciliation, truth-telling must be part of our DNA. And uh, when Jesus was asked, uh, what are the most important commandments? He said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it. Love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And we cannot possibly love our neighbor if we don't know our neighbor or know our neighbor's story. The history of race in Charlottesville can only begin really with the West African slave trade. We have to understand that when we're talking about race in Charlottesville, that's in the larger context of the extraction of approximately 12 million people from West Africa and from Central Africa over the course of three centuries. We often talk about the Middle Passage as the slave trade, and that's absolutely true. But Charlottesville's story with the slave trade is its critical participation in the second slave trade. That one million or so people that are, over the course of a half century, forcibly relocated again from the Upper South to the Lower South, right? And that story implicates Washington, D.C., Alexandria, Richmond, Charlottesville, and other locations. And so when we're talking about the slave trade, in Virginia, and we're talking about slavery and slavery's historical uh, uh, location and the dislocations of, of slavery, we have to recognize that it's actually an out-migration. It's not an in-migration, okay?
So with that. Um, in the middle of all of that, of course, we have the American Revolution. Thomas Jefferson plays a critical role working with uh, um, uh, James Madison on the, uh, the draft of the Constitution, uh, Declaration of Independence, all of these other documents uh, that are so essential to the founding of the new nation. Uh, those documents declare the centrality of human freedom and liberty and, a dem and democratic processes, while simultaneously never dealing with the cancer within, which is the institution of slavery. Right? The failure of our founding fathers to properly grapple with and resolve the institution of slavery is something that would continue to haunt the foundation of the United States through its first three quarter centuries. The high point of the African slave trade also marked, not coincidentally, the period in which higher education in the colonies expanded most rapidly. Sam the Carpenter shows up in the records from almost from the very beginning. We have him tied to the construction of lots of different things, but particularly the roofing system of a couple of the pavilions on this side. He's actually in charge of completing one of the most important carpentry tasks here at the Academical Village. Uh, and that is the completion of a massive roofing system. These are really significant um, uh, uh, construction tasks. So he has, as an enslaved black man, he has people that are reporting to him so that he can complete that, that particular task. Sam the Carpenter, in addition to these roofing systems for both hotel, for pavilions and for hotels, which we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, he is also completing uh, dairies, uh, a stable, uh, he's also uh, uh, producing a barn. And so he's doing all kinds of heavy carpentry around the academic village for the, for the full 10 years of construction. What's interesting about that is about halfway through that process, we see emerging in the records, young Sam. And young Sam is almost always assigned to work with Sam the carpenter as, an, as a carpenter's apprentice. And so we have no way of knowing that young Sam is actually Sam the Carpenter's son, but one can only imagine that that's probably true, right? So young Sam shows up, he's probably in his mid to late teens, and he is working here. He is also enslaved, working with his enslaved father, learning tasks in and around a community of both whites and blacks, enslaved and free, and Sam the Carpenter recognizes that he needs to train his son to navigate a landscape in which he will probably never be free. We have no emotional access to that, and it's probably it is inappropriate for us to try to gain emotional access to what that would be like. But we must just pause and recognize how difficult must that have been to train up and equip your son, knowing that your son is always going to be working under the conditions that you yourself are subject. So it's totally appropriate for us to talk about Thomas Jefferson when we're talking about the, uh, the academical village, right, in the University of Virginia. Completely appropriate. But we also have to recover Sam the Carpenter and the other men like him and fold their stories and their narratives also into the telling of this place. In fact, a university should not be a house but a village. So while we were up on the lawn, the view that Thomas Jefferson wanted us to see of the academical village, how many stories were the pavilions? They were two-story buildings. How many stories are the pavilions? Turns out there are three, right? Um, so Jefferson is um, a bit of a genius designer. He uses topography in brilliant ways. So he has terraced the ridge and he has built buildings on both sides of that ridge, which allow you to con visually consume the academical village from one particular vantage point, and all you see are elevations that are primarily associated with white people, right? Which means that these three-story buildings, the spaces that are explicitly associated with African Americans, are out of view, right? He is designing a way the visibility of the laboring black body. Given his recognition that slavery has despotic tendencies, and he's building an idealized 
university for the formation and graduation of citizen leaders? Of course he's going to do that. He's already done this really well at Monticello, right, many years before. Monticello, Little Mountain, he terraces off that top of that mountain and he builds his house at one side and then uses the ridges, the, the, the topographic change, so that when you're in the garden at Monticello, you can't see all of the spaces of labor, or the majority of the spaces of labor. They're, they're submerged below ground, right? And so that's a tactic that works well, so he deploys it here at the University of Virginia as well. UVA is an architecture of democracy in a landscape of slavery. So if we take a look at Pavilion 4, which is behind me, Pavilion 4, of course, like all the pavilions, is a three-story pavilion. Uh, we know that the very first occupant of this pavilion is George Bladerman, who's a languages professor here at the University of Virginia. And upon his arrival, or soon after his arrival, he actually purchases uh, Lucy Cottrell. Lucy Cottrell is born at Monticello. She is part of the, um, uh, one of the families uh, that is enslaved by uh, Thomas Jefferson at, uh, at Monticello. But at the moment of the death, one of the things we know about Thomas Jefferson, of course, he dies terribly in debt. Uh, and his sons-in-law primarily have to resolve, liquidate the estate. One of the best ways to do that, of course, is to sell off assets. Uh, and so many of the slave families are sold as a result of the resolution of Thomas Jefferson's estate. So Lucy Cottrell and her two sons, her uh, probably uh, pre-adolescent sons at this point, and her ailing mother are sold as a family unit. There's some complicated exchanges, but they end up being purchased uh, by George Bladerman. So when we look at this cellar space, we have to think about that as Lucy Cottrell's accommodations. Unit on the far left uh, is the light that goes into her cook kitchen, right? And so, there's, so that's her cook kitchen, and that's, those are her accommodations. It's remarkable that Lucy Cottrell has a private chamber with two windows, a lockable door, and a heated fireplace. Those are really, really lavish accommodations for an enslaved person in this period, right? Now, when I say private chamber, I mean a private chamber that she, her two sons, and her ailing mother all occupy together. So there's four people uh, in this space. And so it's important for us to recognize that she is the cook. She's probably purchased by George Bladerman, intended to uh, cook for, uh, for him. She might have uh, learned some of the French cooking that Monticello would have been famous for when uh, Thomas Jefferson, of course, uh, takes an enslaved man with him, uh, uh, James Hemings. Uh, and that person is actually, and James is actually trained in a French cooking school in Paris. And so Monticello had a very distinctive cuisine. Uh, would, would differentiated it from any of the other house, households in Virginia in that period. It's possible, we don't know, but it's possible that Lucy Cottrell has learned some of those, um, uh, some of those uh, cooking practices. And so she's a fairly valuable person at the time of her purchase. Um, and so she uh, moves into, she's the first occupant uh, of, this, uh, of this space. And while we think of these spaces, the spaces we're occupying right now, of course, is a parking lot, we have to reverse engineer what that looked like. And in addition to all of the documentary evidence that we've been culling from Jewel and from other uh, repositories of uh, historical evidence, we've also been partnering with archaeologists. And so many of these spaces over time have been excavated by archaeology, and we have a better sense for how these spaces functioned. Uh, this is where we know that the academical village is overrun with hogs. And so there are hogs that are just, which is just true of, I mean, Virginia is overrun with hogs in the early 19th century. They're just everywhere, which is why we get pork barbecue, right? I mean, so there's, there's a history there also to our foodways. Uh, so they are going to be slaughtering, uh, slaughtering hogs and preparing hogs for salting and curing in these spaces. They're going to be plucking chickens. They're going to be butchering chickens. There's going to be kitchen gardens. All of those kinds of things that we associate with an antebellum plantation, they're happening right behind us, right? All of that work is happening here. When we experience the gardens today, the gardens behind the pavilions, they're absolutely beautiful, azalea-lit uh, spaces. Those are all repurposed in the, in the a very late uh, 1940s and early 1950s. None of those would have been the beautified spaces that we, that we experience today, right? One of the great things that we've come to realize is that these doors that are behind us, these black doors, these were entirely unprogrammed by Jefferson. The reason those spaces exist is because they bump up the, the student rooms 
so that the student rooms are on uh, level with the lawn. Like that's their only function. And so these spaces really were just raised foundations, never intended by Jefferson to function in any way. Which means as soon as the University of Virginia opens, they're, they're game, they're free game, right? So these spaces become colonized by occupants in a lot of different ways. We know that the uh, student residents of rooms 10 and 12, which are right over here, write to the Board of Visitors early on, uh, or actually to the um, proctor, early on complaining about the fact that Professor B's boys awaken us early in the morning with the clanging of the milk pans and the mooing of the cow that is stabled in the yard and cellar spaces of our rooms. UVA's famous curvilinear walls, so the serpentine walls, um, almost all of them that you see are rebuilt between 40, 1948 and 1952, right? But they're there. We know that they're there archaeologically. We found the footprints of them, but these are not Jefferson's walls. And the same shape. Same shape, curvilinear, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're not rebuilt, they're moved, right? The, these alleys are wider than the alleys would have been uh, because by the uh, 1948, 1952, what do you have? Yeah, automobiles, right? <laughs> and so yeah, they have to accommodate a different uh, mode of transportation. Uh, so in that, in that reimagining, you get the reconstruction of the walls, you get the installation of these beautiful gardens. Uh, but for us as scholars, we have to peel all of that back. And one of the important things that we've come to realize in the reimagining of these gardens is that these curvilinear walls, when they were first built, were not five feet tall as they are today. They were eight feet tall. They were closer together and eight feet tall. How does that change your experience of these spaces? Claustrophobic, definitely. You can't see, right? So that as I, as a white student, I'm walking between the range where I live and eat, and I'm walking up to the lawn where I'm taking classes. This is the white uh, highway between those two zones. And these eight foot walls separate me and my visibility from the laboring, again, of enslaved bodies, the signifiers of slavery that are, that's unfolding all the time in those yards. We have a landscape that is populated almost exclusively by late teen and early 20s empowered white men. Where, what kind of places are they coming from? They're coming primarily from plantations. How do they interact with enslaved people on their plantations? They presume mastery. These white men presume mastery. These enslaved people are actually not owned by students. The University of Virginia, in its uh, founding codes, actually forbids students from bringing their own enslaved people. So that 140, 100 and so, 140 so people that are here, a minority of them are owned by professors, but the majority of them are owned by hotel keepers. And so this is Hotel A, which is one of the six hotels. If the pavilions dominate the lawn, the six hotels pavilion, uh, dominate the two ranges. Those hotels are the dining halls and the provision of all domestic services for the student population. Every student is uh, a member of one of the six hotels. The hotels are subcontracted out by the university to hotel keepers. So the building is owned by the university, but the hotel keeper is not an employee of the university. The hotel keeper is a subcontractor to the university, which means that if the professors are a minority owner of the enslaved population, who's the majority owner? The hotel keepers. And so a huge cadre of enslaved people are living and operating out of these hotels to provide the daily services for students, which is blackening shoes, starting fires, providing a bucket of cold water, uh, weekly washing laundry, sweeping out the rooms. And so they have people who actually own them who have given them tasks. And then they have a landscape filled with people who also feel perfectly free to give them tasks and responsibilities, even though they're not owned by that person. And so movement, navigating this landscape, 
is really important. Because these enslaved women, primarily, are doing their very best to avoid encountering the students. Because they've already got a full day, <laughs> right? They've already got a full day of tasks. Raising for us the question, what happens when they do encounter these students? Beatings and rape. And that's just a hard truth we have to come to grips with. It shows up in the records. And so moms raising children, some of those children, the product of rape, are laboring constantly to provide services for people who abuse them. And that's the whole of their life. They're desperately trying to build relationships with other enslaved people, build families, healthfully raise children, and make it to old age. And so the human experience here, this is brutal and it's dehumanizing. And so when we think about Sam the Carpenter or Lucy Cottrell, we have the critical responsibility to rehumanize these people and recognize the extraordinary pressures they were under and the brutality and the violence that they survived in an effort to raise their children and to love. What does it look like to love in that kind of condition? Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Jefferson, from the very beginning, builds into the educational system the pursuit of medicine, right? And he wants to ensure that graduates have the capacity for exposure to uh, scientific medical training. That requires uh, human dissection. So Jefferson, from the, uh, the very last building he designs, which is completed after his death, is the anatomical theater, right? A dissection theater where the professor can demonstrate a full body cadaver dissection uh, for the students. Now, it's really important because this is the front edge of, educa of medical education, right? Uh, we have to keep in mind this is the early 19th century. Medicine uh, is not quite as developed as we might uh, uh, want to think it is, <laughs> right? There's some really crazy stuff that's still in the minds of the medical doctor at this period. Um, and so this is um, engaging in scientific medicine Evidence-based medicine, that's a really kind of remarkable and very, very progressive idea in this moment. Um, Jefferson also knows that it's totally inappropriate for a professor to dissect a cadaver on their dining room table in their pavilion. So, by the way, this is going to need a space, <laughs> right? So he designs the anatomical theater. The anatomical theater stood right here. You can see that concrete block just uh, poking out through the mulch. That concrete block is the very center of the building that was the anatomical theater. The standing line would have been that the University of Virginia and MCV and lots of these other schools um, are dissecting felons. Turns out that's not the case, right? The numbers don't work. The majority of the people that are being uh, dissected uh, are um, recently deceased uh, enslaved African Americans. Uh, there are a few early accounts uh, where students are um, in conflict with local plantation owners because they have trespassed on that plantation owner's property and are exhuming a uh, recently deceased African American so that they can complete their coursework by demonstrating a full body dissection. And so in the earliest years, the students are actually going out and uh, providing for themselves these cadavers by exhuming them. Um, a few years ago, we came across a cache of letters uh, by Professor Davis uh, in which he is involved in setting up a um, institutionally supported provision of cadavers. Uh, the source are graveyards in Richmond, and these bodies are being exhumed by people called resurrectionists. And so the way this works is that um, the University of Virginia, via uh, Davis, is setting up a system in which we're paying uh, resurrectionists in Richmond 
to go basically to hover around the edges of the free black and the enslaved black uh, communities, uh, figure out when a burial has happened, exhume the body, pack the body in a barrel, probably with some sawdust for short-term preservation, get that to the train station in Richmond, whereby that, that body or groups of bodies are then brought to Charlottesville. And a man by the name of Anatomical Lewis, who lives in the yard of Pavilion 7, he lives in a shack in uh, the yard of Pavilion 7. It is his job to go uh, recover the bodies from the train station and prepare them for the students for dissection. Uh, after dissection, it's also his job to clean up the room. We also know that according to um, African-American uh, oral history, that this uh, is tied directly to the extension of slavery from life also then into death, perpetual slavery. He, the resurrectionist, says the weather having been so warm here that the subjects are all in incipient putrefaction when buried. I have reconnoitred the grounds myself, and the only colored burial I have noticed, the coffin was already sprung from the decomposition. Uh, we also have to assume that anatomical Lewis, at some point in his life, is preparing for dissection the body of someone he knew. Let me also, just in closing on this section, keep in mind this is not just the University of Virginia that's doing this, right? This is also true of the University of Pennsylvania, MCV. This is, this is commonplace. Richmond is a core source of those cadavers for lots of medical schools because it's a big city. This practice of the provision of African-American bodies, cadavers, for uh, dissection by students taps into a theoretical conversation that's happening at the same, in the same moment. And that is, what are the origins of the species? Right? This would then eventually be, uh, at least in the sort of scientific realm, settled by D Charles Darwin in the 1850s. But D Darwin's not uh, coming up with this entirely on his own. There's a, there's a conversation that's been happening for not quite a century, but for some season before that, uh, that results in what Charles Darwin would eventually publish in The Origins of the Species. When Thomas Jefferson is in Paris uh, in the late 1780s, he writes a, his only treatise called Notes on the State of Virginia. Ha and this is just one of a number of passages that Jefferson uses as a way of characterizing uh, using scientific observation, right, which is the Enlightenment mode, using scientific observation to differentiate between two different people groups, individuals that he sees as white and individuals who he sees as black. So what he's trying to do here is he's, he's trying to parse the space to say, yes, they in fact are all a single species, right? African Americans and white Americans conform to a singular species. Why would he need to make that argument? He's committed to the theory of monogenesis as opposed to polygenesis. This is language from the early 19th century. What might polygenesis suggest? Oh, wait a second. God only made one man and one woman, right? And so his scientific evidence and his commitment to monogenesis, the singular story, collides. And so he resolves that by saying that there are particularities, right? That you have varietals, as you might in gardening. You'll have varietals with different colors but within the same species. And that those varieties are produced by environment. What's the outworking of that thinking? African Americans are black because they come from Africa, which is hot. Right? So that sort of notion of environmental determinism, of the color of one's skin as a result of the fact they're coming from a really, really sunny, hot place, finds its origins in Cavill, right? Cavill resolves that. So one species dispersed in ancient times for the resulting of two varietals. This is the medical theory of the origins of the species that is being taught at the University of Virginia for 50 years. Cavill is the chairman of the faculty, so he is the most respected the most celebrated faculty member 
on the faculty at the University of Virginia through the Civil War. He gives up that post to Paul Berenger. So it is our leading med medical theoreticians who are the most well-respected faculty members on the faculty at the University of Virginia. Paul Berenger would take over that post. Berenger would arrive sometime in the sort of 1890s. Uh, in 1900, he writes this treatise, The American Negro, His Past and His Future. And he would continue to um, uh, teach at the University of Virginia through the first couple decades of the 20th century. And so Paul Berenger would pick up the teaching of medical theory from Davis, right? And they would both be the chairman of the faculty. So that's the framework around race that's being taught across the University of Virginia and especially in our medical school. Ivy Lewis, another educator at UVA, would also later write, the mixing of whites and blacks was the chief cause of the fall of the civilizations of Rome, Greece, Egypt, and India. So not only was slavery, in fact, a historical good because it was a civilizing force, racial mixing is incomprehensible because racial mixing re results ultimately in what he would refer to as the laxness of morals. This ties directly moral fortitude, intellectual capacity, and black DNA, right? This is presumed to be consistent in the early 20th century. So eugenics is being taught at the medical school. It is a presupposed uh, condition of educational training for medical science at UVA uh, through the opening decades and probably into the 50s and 60s um, among some faculty here at the University of Virginia. And so that's an intellectual and educational precondition. We have intense race, t racial tension across the United States in the, te in the te late teens and early 20s. And that actually would result in 1924 in the passing of two acts. In 1924, the state of Virginia passes the Racial Integrity Act, which has at its core this phrase, the one drop rule. It legally defines whiteness. And it legally defines blackness, right? Any racial mixing, because of the laxness of morals, that interracial engagement results, not even just uh, not even marriages, just interracial mixing results in, in the laxness of morals. Therefore, segregation is essential for the success of our democracy. In ways that slavery was a good for the savages coming from Africa. These are all consistent thoughts, right? It's very hard for us to access that framework. It should be very hard for us to access that framework. But this is commonplace language in the early 20th century. The second act that would be passed is what's called the Eugenical Sterilization Act. So based on the uh, sup supposed truth of eugenics, those individuals that had moral, structural, uh, intellectual shortcomings should not be allowed to reproduce. And so they were sterilized, resulting in, over the course of about 50 years, 7,000 sterilizations in the state of Virginia. So in 1924, we see both the Racial Integrity Act, presupposing the rightness and the goodness of segregation for the protection of white integrity, and the Sterilization Act, which actually works to sterilize those individuals who do not conform to certain presupposed expectations on, a, on benchmarks of a racial hierarchy. So many people think that racism is this mysterious thing, but it hits and causes health disparities right at a personal level. So I'm a mother of three children. You're a parent as well. And I tell you that when my children hit driving age, the same way you're going to have anxiety, I'm going to hang, have anxiety. My anxiety is going to be different, though. Because of structural racism, I'm worried not only that my children might drive poorly, 
but that they might get stopped by a police officer who is taught because of racism to be afraid of them, right? That police officer does not have to be a good or bad person. I've been stopped by that police officer, right? Where I'm driving out of my office at the university and the police officer stops me because of a tag, a tail light, anything doing his or her job. In this instance, it was her, and she's trembling. She's not trembling because she's afraid of her job. She's trembling because she's afraid of me, right? So I'm up at night, every night worried, not only that my kid's driving is a problem, but that if they get stopped by the police and make one false move, they're dead, right? And I'm afraid of that night in, day in, and night out, day out, right? In Charlottesville, over the past 25 years, on average, the difference in infant mortality rates between black and white mothers has been an unacceptable average two and a half to three times greater for blacks than whites, right? So that would mean that over time, a black mother in Charlottesville today is two and a half to three times more likely to lose her child in the first year of birth, the after birth rather, than a white mother is. Now many times in public health when we look at these types of disparities, we think they will correct when we control for education and for income, or what we call socioeconomic status. And how we know that this is just not a poverty issue but a racial issue is this. If we control for income and education, we don't see that disparity disappear. So a middle class mom who is making between 50 and $75,000 a year, who has a college education, still is over two times more likely to lose her baby in the first year of life than a white mom who is below the poverty line and has only finished an eighth grade education. Mm. So that's what we call a race specific problem. Mm -hmm. The history of healthcare access for blacks in Charlottesville is not that they were welcome at either the University of Virginia or at Martha Jefferson, right? So the doors were open, but they were open to the basement. Mm -hmm. The doors were open, but they were open to inequitable care, right? right? So I think the well-meaning people of Charlottesville that I know, most of the white citizens of Charlottesville would say, that was terrible, mm -hmm. and I'm so glad it's over, right? right? right. Um, but the point is that it's not over. A person who gets ahead by oppressing the poor or by showering gifts on the rich will end in poverty. As early as 1863, the black uh, uh, congregants of First Baptist Church petitioned for the establishment of their own church. And so we see the migration between 1863 and 1865 the establishment of the first holy black um, uh, Baptist church in Charlottesville, and that's First Baptist Church. Not that building, but that site. Um, what's a little surprising about that is more than 100 individuals that are, that are um, um, moving to establish that uh, congregation it, within months of the conclusion of the Civil War, right? And so there is a, there's an, um, a kind of commitment to the establishment of, of, of black institutionalism and black identity within months of the, of the echoes uh, of the Civil War, which is really sort of astonishing. It is also um, the aggregating of the formerly free black community. And so here we have to st step back just briefly to recognize that African Americans um, in uh, Charlottesville and most other cities uh, in this period, in all other cities in the South in this period, are divided between the enslaved and the free. There has been, over the 19th century, the growth of a free black community. Those individuals who have been able to use the generation of wealth to then purchase their own children out of the institution of slavery and give them an identity as a free person, a free person of color, right? So that by the time of the Civil War, particularly urban centers, have these populations of free people of color. That community of free people of color then has, they already have uh, some established wealth, right? 
uh, and they have the capacity to band together to establish this, uh, this church. Now, it is not at all an accident that the location of that church is right on Main Street. Okay? The major public thoroughfare through the city of Charlottesville. They're claiming a space in the public square. They're planting their flag as a black institution in the landscape of the city. That's a courageous move. And that courage comes from the promise of reconstruction. Right? At the end of the Civil War, there is this season that we don't tend to talk a whole lot about, which is the political reconstruction of the South. Uh, the forced um, enfran enfranchisement of African Americans, their defense to the right of the vote, and this results in this season of the, particularly the, 17, the 1870s, of black presence in legislative bodies. This is a really important factor for us to recognize. African Americans are elected to Congress and to the House of Delegates. And they're being drawn largely from this established free black population. Individuals who have been educated, who have begun to develop wealth, right? Um, but by the 1880s, that's no longer true. There's a profound difference between the 1870s and the 1880s in terms of the racial inclusion of our governing bodies. What is that? It's the collapse of Reconstruction in the Compromise of 1877. The Compromise of 1877 brought Ruther Rutherford B. Hayes, a Republican, into the White House. Now we have to, have to recognize the Republicans are actually the racial progressives in this moment, right? So Rutherford B. Hayes is brought into the White House, but it's a hotly contested presidential election, and so there has to be a compromise for that conclusion. So Ruther Rutherford B. Hayes, a progressive, gets the White House, but what the Democrats get is the withdrawal of federal troops from across the American South. The reason African Americans are enfranchised in this season is because the federal government has made a military and a political commitment to ensure that enfranchisement, and that is what we call Reconstruction. Reconstruction ends with the Compromise of 1877. And so the progressives get the White House, but the Democrats get full authority back over the South. That's a really, really important moment in Charlottesville's racial history. So that when a second congregation is established, Ebenezer, it's built here, right? Firmly ensconced in the heart of Star Hill neighborhood, which is the middle class black neighborhood, right? African Americans have been forcibly, they've withdrawn because of disenfranchisement. They've withdrawn from the public sphere of the main street, right? That retreat, that retreat has everything to do with the failure of the federal government to ensure the protection of their enfranchisement. Although Albemarle County elected James Thomas Sammons Taylor as one of the 24 African Americans elected to the 1867-68 Virginia Constitutional Convention, the slow erosion of black political agency in the following decades resulted in the passage of the 1902 Virginia Constitution passed by an all-white convention and the institution of poll taxes, effectively delimiting black voting for more than 60 years. And so we see this season then between the eight, uh, from 1877, the 1880s, into the 1920s, which is exactly the season that we've been talking about with race riots, right? Wrongly called, wrongly named race riots, lynching, systemic disenfranchisement, eugenics. Middle class African Americans begin building a deep infrastructure of their own neighborhoods. <laughs> 
And that's what Star Hill is. Star Hill, the neighborhood behind me, emerges in this period as the safe space for middle class African Americans. You also begin to see the rise of certain institutions. And we're going to talk about three, or maybe even four, uh, here in Star Hill. The first we're going to talk about is this funeral home, Bell's Funeral Home. Bell's Funeral Home is established, as the sign says, in 18, uh, 1917. Uh, Raymond Bell, in the middle of the 20th century, would be one of the co-founders of the NAACP here in Charlottesville. And Raymond Bell would also be the very first African American on Charlottesville city school system. And so because of their, um, uh, their social capital, uh, in the city. They're, of course, they're going, uh, I don't know which church they go to, right? But there's these two African American churches that are really important. They're certainly attending one of those churches. They're an anchor of this community, right? And so the, uh, and, they, and they remain that way. And so uh, Bell's Funeral Home uh, sort of reminds us of the agency of African Americans to find cracks in the system, to exploit those cracks as a way of uh, sustaining themselves in, this, in the kind of context of what everything else is going on in the early 20th century in, uh, in Charlottesville and all other cities. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So when you actually look at urban morphology, urban morphology is the study of the shapes of cities. And you look at um, uh, elevation in most inland cities, the vast majority of inland cities, the lowest occupied spaces closest to the core are almost always occupied by African Americans. So this spine, which is pre uh, predominantly occupied by um, some white occupied houses, but primarily the commercial zone, uh, white managed commercial zone, has behind it and, and below it on both sides uh, the principal African American uh, neighborhoods. This is a particularly important bridge because this bridge goes over and has, since the mid-19th century, gone over uh, a railroad track and was often the dividing line between the two halves of the city. This particular bridge uh, was uh, declared in the late 20th century the Drury Brown Bridge. It was named as the Drury Brown Bridge. Drury Brown is one of Charlottesville's most important African-American civil rights leaders who nobody knows anything about, <laughs> right? Drury Brown, in 1964, co-founded MACA, MACA, which is now associated with some gyms and other uh, sort of infrastructural uh, investments for African Americans, primarily African Americans in the city, was founded as a, um, a civil rights nonprofit organization intended specifically to eradicate poverty uh, for African American families in Charlottesville. Drew Brown did that work uh, for 30 years, dedicated 30 years of his life uh, to uh, reinvestment of Charlottesville's African American community. Uh, and uh, soon after his death, this bridge was dedicated uh, in his honor. And you can see that, well, you can't see because they're uh, positioned. As we're crossing, you'll see the names of plaques. And other people have been given the honor of uh, bridge builder, the Bridge Builder Award uh, is also associated with this particular bridge. And so individuals that have been committed to he the health and well-being of the whole community of Charlottesville, a comprehensive and inclusive view of that well-being, are honored annually, and their names are placed on this bridge. So this is a really, really important bridge when it comes to uh, civil action and the defense of justice for African Americans specifically in the city of Charlottesville. Drury Brown was committed to that work because he lost his father at the age of three to a lynching. Which takes us yet to the next difficult subject. I had the great honor of participating uh, about three months ago now this summer on a pilgrimage that was uh, organized by Jelaine Schmidt, a UVA faculty member, and Andrea Douglas, the director of the Jefferson School, while we'll be in a few minutes. It was a week-long pilgrimage from Charlottesville to the Equal Justice Initiative in Alabama. The Equal Justice Initiative is the location, the location of the newly opened Lynching Museum. Uh, it's an incredibly powerful and incredibly important site that is finally giving due justice to the racial violence and the illegal murder of well over 4,000 people. 
not just in the American South, but concentrated in the American South between the 1880s and into the 1930s. John Henry James uh, was passing through Charlottesville. Uh, he um, was accused of uh, making a pass of some sort at a white woman at Penn Park. Uh, that resulted in a group of white men accusing him and capturing him, detaining him. Uh, the city of Charlottesville uh, was such up in arms over this assault on a white woman that uh, he was actually relocated to Stanton for safekeeping while his trial was unfolding. The charge of assault of a white woman by a black man was the most common reason given for lynching. Recent DNA research demonstrates that more than one fourth of African American men carry a Y chromosome of European origin, suggesting the historical reality was of white men assaulting black women. He was relocated because there was such a tradition in the American South of mobs of white men going and extracting these black men and just lynching them on the spot. White men who had full control of the justice system and the policing system supplanted that for their own emotionally driven, riot-based justice system. John Henry James was being returned uh, from Stanton for his trial in Charlottesville. A mob of more than a hundred men, none masked, stopped the train. They stood on the tracks to stop the train. The sheriff, who was bringing John Henry James back to Charlottesville, watched as the men boarded the train, pulled him off the train, gave him a few minutes to pray, and then dragged him to, our, to a blacksmith shop just off of what was called Ivy Crossing and lynched him. The sheriff was there and saw the whole thing unfold. 100 men, mostly from Charlottesville. That's going to be inclusive of people from the University of Virginia. No one was prosecuted. Not a single name was ever mentioned. That should be horrifying and terrifying, but it was also commonplace. So John Henry James's local story reminds us that the Albemarle County and Charlottesville are part and parcel of a landscape, a broad landscape of violence, racially motivated violence across the American South and beyond the American South in the late 19th and early 20th century. Oh, my people out yonder, hear me. They do not love your neck unnoosed and straight, so love your neck. Put a hand on it, grace it, stroke it, and hold it up. And all your inside parts that they just as soon slop for hogs, you got to love them. The dark, dark liver, love it, love it. And the beat and beating heart, love that too. So this is one of Charlottesville's two really important city squares, right? The other, of course, now is now dominated by the Lee statue and was marked by most of the churches in the city of Charlottesville by the late, 18th, late 19th and early 20th centuries. This site was not surrounded by churches, but this site was surrounded by law offices, right? This is the political and legal heart of the city of Charlottesville. And it has been, since the late 18th century, dominated by the courthouse, right? The courthouse, the Jefferson designed, Thomas Jefferson designed courthouse, um, is a really important fixture. Uh, there was, uh, for a long time through the uh, late 19th and into the early 20th century, an alley that ran here. And so the, this square was actually two squares subdivided by an alley. And this site was dominated by a housing complex called McKee's Row. And it was a 
uh, just a huge boarding house, right? One big multi multiple unit boarding house, a tenement row. Uh, the other important fixture is on the far side of the square, and that's the um, uh, slave auction block, right? So we do know the location of the slave auction block through the, um, into the early 19th century, and that's exactly on the opposite side. So um, racial disenfranchisement has already been uh, part and parcel of, of this landscape even before the period that we're talking about. So this is the center of authority and power in the city of Charlottesville. In 1917, two African-American men are charged with stealing a chicken, or accused of stealing a chicken, and they're pursued uh, by a police officer who's armed. They are unarmed. In the midst of that, uh, in the grappling that goes back and forth between these individuals, one of the African-American men uh, man disarms the armed police officer and shoots the police officer with his own gun. This results in the immediate incarceration of those two men in the jail that is just down this alley. So if you follow this alley over the street, you'll actually see a, a gray stone building. Uh, that's the building where these two men were uh, temporarily uh, uh, held uh, in the days after their capture. Two nights later, there emerges a crowd of some hooded but most unhooded white men uh, with torches surrounding the jail, demanding the release of these two men to the crowd. 1917, what are their intentions? It's a lynching, right? So this is a lynching mob. And they have every intention of a double lynching on the location of the shooting of the white police officer. The newspaper account the next day unfolds the event over the course of the night before in extensive detail. The tension grows over the course of about eight to 10 hours. At dusk, or at nightfall, the crowd grows. We know that they're actually gathering because they're, the streets are named. They're coming down this alley. There's so many of them. They're filling the alley. They're filling the side streets as they're catcalling and chanting for the release of these two men from the jail. The sheriff and his deputy are standing armed guard at the jail, refusing to have these two men released to the crowd. The, sh the sheriff is getting increasingly anxious um, and bec uh, because he's heard that reinforcements for the crowd are coming, are marching from the university. Right? So the first wave of the mob are townies. The second wave of the mob are, are coming from the university. And that's because we actually now have evidence that Charlottesville in these years has two chapters of the KKK, not just one. The University of Virginia has its own chapter, right? And so this is the convergence of two chapters around the intention of a, an illegal murder of two men by lynching. Um, the sheriff is getting nervous because he's heard, heard tell that they're coming. And we actually, the, uh, the written description has the route that the university men are walking, and it's the route we just took. Uh, their intention is to convene and by force extract the men from the jail. So the sheriff, in a panic, requests reinforcements from Stanton and asks the sheriff and Stanton to put 50 armed men on a train and get them to Charlottesville as soon as possible. Okay, so they're actually loaded on the train and they're on their way to Charlottesville. 50 armed men. Um, the sheriff is not certain that they'll arrive in time, so he calls out the fire department. The fire department is, inten the intention is that he's gonna ask the fire department to deploy the, uh, the fire engine, the water, the water pump, on the crowd to disperse the crowd. When the fire uh, team arrives, they realize that the riot is by white men, and they refuse to uh, use their machine to disperse the crowd. In fact, many of them join the crowd. Cooler heads eventually prevail, and over a many, many, many hour conversation between the sheriff and the crowd, the crowd eventually disperses and goes home. And so this doesn't actually show up as a lynching, because it's an unsuccessful attempt. But now I want you to remind me 
what's the urban environment in which this is all happening? What building is here? McKee's Row, largely black occupied tenement. They're looking out their windows all night long at this event. Okay? So that's happening in 1917. In the August of 1920, Congress makes this radical move of women's suffrage. They actually give women the vote. But I find fascinating Virginia's and specifically Charlottesville's response to that. Hear this. Virginia Democrats respond in August of 1920. Negro women are making desperate attempts to register. This is, in his, this is in their mind a serious problem because Negro women are more intelligent than Negro men. Therefore, they're much more successful in meeting the requirements of the voter registration laws. He appeals to women in Virginia to look to Democratic white women of the state, whether they favor equal suffrage or not, to maintain the prestige, the integrity, the traditions, and the honor of Virginia by voting. And so what we actually have embedded in this claim, this appeal, is white men in Virginia appealing to white women to vote to ensure that those votes outweigh the votes of all African Americans. So racism is a greater fear, is a greater driver than is the rise of suffrage. And months before this monument is unveiled, the KKK in 1921, of that summer, have a meeting. So it's unveiling in October. They're meeting in August in the courthouse. The KKK is meeting in the courthouse. And they declare that law and order must prevail. All undesirables must leave town. The eye of the unknown has been and is constantly observing. We see all. We hear all. We know all. Now, this is a bulletin that's posted all over Charlottesville inviting people to come to the KKK speeches that are being held in the courthouse three months before this monument is unveiled. They also, it's also an invitation. It's a recruiting event. They invite any 100% white, native-born American man who holds to the tenets of the Christian religion, free schools, free speech, free press, law enforcement, liberty, and white supremacy. And so if you're willing to and aligned with all of those initiatives, you are welcome, and you meet, you, you meet the rules, you're welcome to join the KKK, right? Now, in the midst of all of the other structures of disenfranchisement, which in the late 19th and early 20th century are already at play in Charlottesville, imagine what it means as an African American to read a bulletin on the side of a building that says, we see all, we hear all, we know all. Why do the KKK wear hoods? It's a strategic move to mask their own identity so that you as an African American have no idea who's in the KKK and who's not. Every white man then becomes the KKK for you. It's the use of costume to exhibit terror in everyday life. And so the fear that a woman, an enslaved woman, would have at the University of Virginia navigating that landscape has not changed. Into the early 20th century, it is still a landscape of terror. And then two months later, this monument is unveiled. Let's go take a look at it. OK, so once again, the subject of this monument, of course, is Stonewall Jackson, the Civil War leader. But I want to divert our eyes from the monument to the pedestal. Look at the pedestal for a moment. 
Who are the figures on the crest of the ped pediment? Two white people, yes. One male and one female. She is faith and he is valor. They are both winged, which means they're allegorical ideals. What is he holding? The shield of the battle flag of the Confederacy. In the racial hierarchy that we've been teaching at the University of Virginia through the late, the late 19th and early 20th centuries, that informs our medical practices, that informs our education in the classrooms, that supposition of a racial hierarchy has at the very top Aryans. These two figures are Aryans, installed in the 1920s, in 1924. The codes that substantiate the apartheid regime of South Africa are based on scholars who come to the American South to study American race law in the American South. This has all been revealed recently in a Princeton University Press book entitled Hitler's American Model. Hitler and the Nuremberg Codes are inspired by the landscape you've just traversed and the legal and social politics that are at play and that animate this place through the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The fact that we have Aryan figures on a monument in a public space is not an accident. This is the intentional and strategic dislocation of African Americans, real people, and their replacement by idealized, perfected white people. The rich man had many flocks and herds, but he took the poor man's lamb. What is the responsibility of the Christian to the economically disenfranchised? Right? Are we, in fact, supposed to take care of the poor? Turns out there's quite a bit of sentiment in Scripture that, in fact, we as Christians are supposed to attend to the needs of the poor. Right? How we do that's a different question. But the simple fact that we are in fact intended to attend to the needs of the poor seems to be a pretty constant theme through scriptures. The average black family in America today has between one-seventh or one-tenth the wealth of the average white family in America today. What is wealth? And how is wealth different from income? Personal gain over time plus inheritance. What is the foundation of wealth in America? Home ownership. What we have to recognize when we look at a neighborhood like Star Hill is that unlike white neighborhoods, which are purely residential, Star Hill is mixed use, professional residential. Because most of these black professionals don't have nearly the access to office spaces, right? They don't have that kind of capacity, either financially or in, just in terms of being able to navigate white spaces. And so this space is a little city inserted in the middle of the city. So we have the funeral parlor. We have the doctor's office. This really fantastic building immediately behind you uh, with the Corinthian columns was initially built as a church. But fairly soon thereafter, it transitions into Barrett's daycare. So if you're familiar with Barrett Early Learning Center, that's the same, that's the same uh, company. If you have hope of sending your kid off to schooling, which we'll be talking about in a little bit, you're going to have to pay for that. That means mom has to work also, right? And so black families are having to make a very conscious and regular choice about being home with their kids or sending their kids to daycare so that their future kids might actually have the possibility of an education. And so we see the rise then of Barrett's Daycare, uh, which is the state of Virginia's oldest continually operating daycare. Not at all an accident that it's black uh, founded and black managed, right? Uh, it's established in the 1930s. So Barrett's Daycare is the, second, the third of three institutions. The last is this brick fronted building. 
you take a look at this white building with the brick front, uh, that was the uh, residence and offices of a uh, financier and mortgage company. The um, city of Charlottesville, like many other cities across the state of Virginia, uh, established a uh, segregation code in 1912. So there is officially on the books a segregation code that says this neighborhood must be exclusively white, this neighborhood must be exclusively black, right? And so if you're seeking to be a homeowner, the racial codes of the city say you can only buy houses in certain areas, right? Um, it's also quite clear that banks and mortgage and lending institutions give far better preferential treatment to their white customers than they do to their black customers, forcing African Americans to pay more for the money they're, they're borrowing. So you then see the rise of a black-owned and black-managed uh, uh, a, a banking and mortgage infrastructure as a way of contesting that so that blacks can actually own buildings. They, they can own their houses, right? This, in, in the early 20th century, there's a middle-class black uh, community that wants to be homeowners. The city of Charlottesville has said that's delimited to certain zones of the city, and we're going to make it difficult for you to actually get a loan. These are, that's what structural racism looks like in the early 20th century. Now, the federal government uh, declares that kind of race-based uh, uh, spatial zoning unconstitutional. It makes its way to the Supreme Court. It's declared unconstitutional in 1917. Okay? So one would think that might actually fix the problem. It doesn't. What happens starting in the 1920s is that house builders who are building complexes of houses start writing into the deeds race-based covenants. So a housing property will have all kinds of covenants. The house has to be set back so far from the street. So if I'm developing a, a couple blocks of housing, there's going to be all kinds of covenants. All of our houses have covenants in, in them. Many of them are uh, just about conformity to the street. It has to be two stories. It can only be one story. It has to be built out of these materials. Uh, it can only be sold to a white person. Right? So when neighborhood zoning by race becomes unconstitutional in 1917, you then see the rise of um, race-based covenants, which are then written into uh, uh, all housing covenants. More than 75 percent, Jordy Yeager is the guy who's doing all the research on uh, race-based covenants right now in Charlottesville, and he's found that at least 75 percent, maybe more, of all houses built between 1920 and 1968, when the Fair Housing Act makes this also unconstitutional. Uh, that's a long period of time. Almost all of Charlottesville's houses have Caucasian race only written into the, con uh, into the covenant of the house. Charlottesville remains a city with neighborhoods segregated by race. Here's what happens with that covenant is it does two things. One, it permanently segregates the city, mm -hmm. right? And so this is, this is right around the time when Jim Crow laws start being enacted throughout right. the South. Um, you, you have the black codes, obviously, uh, that, that followed emancipation. Um, you have this very small window of reconstruction where African Americans are actually elected in large numbers to the state legislature. Yep. Um, more, as a percentage, they have more African Americans in the mm -hmm. state legislature then than we have now. Mm -hmm. um, right. And and Charlottesville is not absent from that conversation. We send state legislatures right. there. Um, then you have uh, the emergence of black wealth, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have John West, who mm -hmm. I think is the largest property owner, black or white, mm -hmm. around the turn of the century. He owns 95 properties. He owns part of Afton Mountain. He owns the Dairy Building downtown. He owns the building next to the Paramount. Um, he, this is this is a very mm -hmm. well-to-do African American man, and I think that that scares a lot of white families right. and white politicians and mm -hmm. government officials. Um, and so you see a series of actions that then follow that, right? Uh, the statues go up in 1921 right. and 1924 downtown, mm -hmm. the Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson statues. Um, you, see, you see different efforts of, of seizing property, of eminent domain mm -hmm. being uh, undertaken throughout the city around that same time too. And that's really, I mean, from 1912 to 1917, we actually pass an ordinance. I was that just going to ask you about that. Yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. so this says, uh, and, and we follow on the heels of Richmond and Baltimore, and, and so it should be said that, you know, we're not alone in this by any right. means, but we do pass it. Um, the, the mayor vetoes it, council overrides the veto, and they pass it, and the ordinance basically prevents uh, uh, blocks 
from selling. So if, if a block is uh, predominantly African American, then nobody can sell to a white person right. who wants to buy on that right. block. Now, right. of course, the blocks that were African American are relatively small and few in number in comparison to mm -hmm. the predominantly white blocks. Right. And so really this was a, uh, a, a, you know, a quote unquote equitable way to be racist. Mm -hmm. 25% of the families in the city of Charlottesville do not make enough money to pay for the essentials of life, food, shelter, clothing, utilities, and the cost associated with working, child care, and transportation. The majority of those families are African American. So if you duck under that tree, you can see an old brick building with a gray, br gray wood addition behind it. That's a, that building is Inge's Grocery Store. Inge's Grocery Store from the late 19th century was the uh, black occupied, black managed grocery store providing provisions for most of Charlottesville. It's the only commercial building on what was the commercial zone of Vinegar Hill that was not leveled, okay? So from Inge's grocery store all the way through, do you see the white cupola on the horizon? The white cupola on the horizon is the cupola on Lane High School. It's now the county office building. So exactly in the space of the three high schools of the city of Charlottesville, uh, from Lane High School all the way through the Omni Hotel, and you can just barely see the OM of the Omni, the whole footprint of the Omni Hotel. That was the Vinegar Hill neighborhood. The Jefferson School stood at the bridge between Star Hill and Vinegar Hill. Star Hill is on a higher elevation. Vinegar Hill is on lower elevation. The vote was taken in 1960. Within months of the integration of these schools, the vote was taken in 1960. And by 1964, that work was being enacted on the urban infrastructure of Vinegar Hill. Hundreds of houses a church, and 29 businesses were leveled as a result of the decision to engage in urban renewal in that year. Urban renewal is the taking of bulldozers and leveling everything in its way, right? It's the seizure of land by eminent domain, by a government institution, for the um, prospect of urban uh, improvement. Right? Now, it's important for us to recognize that this is actually a progressive ideal in this period. Urban renewal is about improving the well-being of everybody in the city. That's the language of urban renewal. Um, Vinegar Hill has, at this end, houses that look just like the houses that we've walked through in Star Hill. Right? But as you move down the hill, you get to what was called the bottoms. And the bottoms was the washout zone. All of this rain would run down a big creek that's now McDonald's parking lot. That was called the bottoms, and that was filled with shanties. Shanties and the houses adjacent to them that had never had water, power, or sewer. Now we have to recognize that the fact that this neighborhood didn't have water, power, and sewer was actually a conscious choice made by city planners when neighborhoods and particularly black neighborhoods petitioned for the investment by the city for those infrastructures they were denied so the city is making choices to enfranchise some neighborhoods with water power and sewer and not to enfranchise other neighborhoods with water power and sewer yet in 1960 the city government makes a choice to level this neighborhood because it doesn't have water, power, and sewer, right? It's unhealthy and it's unsightly. And so it's in exactly the same moment that the housing project that we now call West Haven was built to accommodate all of the people who've been forcibly removed from their houses by eminent domain from Vinegar Hill. Now, some families who owned their houses were able to relocate to other districts of the city. But a big chunk of these houses were occupied by tenants, African-American tenants, and they were all removed to West Haven. <laughs>
And so if at city council meetings you hear and feel the anger of residents of West Haven, you get some sense for where that anger is coming from. The city has been unjust. To the, and keep in mind, this has happened in the 1960s. The older residents of West Haven were born and grew up here. And the painful legacy of that is it was leveled in 1964, and this building is the first building to be built. And it wasn't until the mid-1980s. So this zone stood as a vacated scar of mud for 20 years. Eminent domain presupposes investment. We're going to take this property because we're going to improve it. Charlottesville failed on that second part. They took the property, they relocated the families, they demolished 29 businesses, hundreds of homes and a church, but they never made any investment. So that African Americans who are walking around this city are walking by the heart and soul of one of their neighborhoods that was leveled with no plan. There was a remarkable emptiness in that pain. In that searing moment, I realized the loss he was describing was, in a crucial way, the collective loss. It was the loss of a massive web of connections, a way of being that had been destroyed by urban renewal. It was a chorus of voices that rose in my head with the cry, we have lost one another. Root shock is the traumatic stress reaction to the destruction of all or part of one's emotional ecosystem. When I'm in trouble, if I find myself in crisis, I'm going to rely on my friend network. If I am an upper middle class white man, as I am, my friend network has an enormous power. They have all kinds of connections. They have resources I can, I can lean on, right? So when I hit crisis, I'm fine. But if all of my neighbors and all of my friends have, have had limited access as I have, then my social network is significantly more constrained so that when I hit crisis, I'm much more likely to collapse under that crisis. 2018 marked the 50th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act. But since 1900, the gap between white and black home ownership in America has expanded. Since, since 1900, the gap in home ownership has expanded. Do we not have all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously each against his brother? So the Jefferson School is established in 1865 as the black school in Charlottesville, right? Um, a lot of black agents together um, uh, with some of their white allies for a brief season uh, established the Jefferson School. Uh, and it becomes a critical backbone of the black community in Charlottesville, together with First Baptist Church. Uh, so the Jefferson School uh, is um, sort of fully recognized, it's presupposed in this period through Reconstruction and immediately after Reconstruction that, of course, blacks will be educated separately from whites. This becomes instantiated in, um, in what law in 1896, or what, uh, what court case? Plessy versus Ferguson, right? Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896, establishes uh, a legally defensible uh, clause of, of what phrase? Separate, Separate but equal, right? This becomes uh, uh, operational, uh, op essentially operational law uh, through the first half of the 20th century. Plessy vers versus Ferguson um, is instantiates what, had already, what was already being practiced uh, here in Charlottesville, and that is uh, clear segregation or clear separation between black education and, and white education. By the time I was in the seventh grade, my mom, my mother and father were approached to allow me to go to 
began to be a part of integrating the school uh, system uh -huh. because what they were looking for were the best students, the mm -hmm. cream. Mm -hmm. And my mother and father wouldn't let me do it. Mm. And I remember crying. I remember coming home uh -huh. and finding out that they had made the decision that I couldn't go. Wow. And I remember lying on my bed and wow. crying and crying. Wow. But the truth is, I'm glad I didn't because I got to have opportunities I would have never had. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. I grew in a different way mm -hmm. because of those opportunities. Mm -hmm. I think I might have had anger that I don't have, yeah. for one thing. Sure. Mm. And so <clears throat> I'm not sure mm. of all their reasoning, but they decided, I think, to continue that nurturing and that yeah. protecting. Yeah. Well, I can only imagine as a parent <laughs> myself, it's a tough spot mm -hmm. when <coughs> you feel like there's a right choice to be made, but at the cost of my kid. Yeah. Right? That's yeah. a hard, yeah. hard And I mean, I, I admire those mothers and fathers who did. Sure. But I appreciated mine too. Yeah. I didn't at the time. Right. You were angry. Yeah, at the time, I was yeah. very disappointed. Mm -hmm. You know, I was like, hey, yeah. I'm 12. I'm ready for this. I can do it. Wow. <laughs> Charlottesville's black-white educational achievement gap is among the worst nationwide, and that gap is growing. Now, Jefferson School is established as a grade school, right? And it does not have a high school. The absence of a black high school uh, is a continuous thorn for black leaders in Charlottesville. And in 1919, the pastor of First Baptist Church named Clarence Long has finally had enough and he agitates and gets all of the other black ministers in Charlottesville for the course of a season to preach against educating especially black boys to work with their hands, right? Because the educational system presupposes that black boys are going to graduate and go right into the manual arts. Right? What does that mean? Carpentry, masonry, right? Why is that? Because of course, we've been, you know, we believe racialized eugenics, race-based medicine. We all know that African Americans don't actually have an intellect. There's no point in sending them to, grad to high school and then on to college. Because of course, the science coming out of the University of Virginia <laughs> has reinforced the simple fact that uh, and a grade school education is sufficient. Clarence Long, together with a number of the other black ministers, reminding us that the place of the black church has always been around issues of social justice, right? That politics and black religion are uh, closely aligned because the black church has been the anchor uh, institution for black communities. Uh, so Clarence Long and his uh, other African-American um, uh, ministers band together and they preach a series of sermons agitating against this. The response by the white, I was going to say the white dominated, it's not white dominated, the exclusively white uh, uh, Charlottesville City School Board is fine, that's great. And they take out the wood shop. So if you don't want to educate your kids uh, to the manual arts, it's not that we'll improve the educational system. They actually take out the wood shop. Fine, they take the wood shop away. So by 1926, things have gotten frustrating enough that the African American community has finally convinced the um, uh, city school board that African Americans have a right to a high school education. And the first move is great. We'll give you a high school education, except that it's only two years ninth and 10th grades. They still can't graduate with a diploma. Within three years, it's demonstrated that the pressures are so great. There are so many African-American children that are doing well in those two grades that the white school board finally caves and actually gives them a full four-year high school education. So that by, 18, by 1926, you can be black in Charlottesville and actually graduate with a high school diploma Think about that, what, what I've just said. So from 1865 
1926, if you're a lower middle class or middle class black family living in Charlottesville, how do you send your kid to college? It's just not even on the radar unless you have enough wealth to pay a remote tuition and to board your kid. That's a structural limitation that says you simply can't go to high school. You simply can't go to college. So this is the legacy that African Americans have been fighting against by the time we get to the years of the 1930s and the 1940s, right? All of that is in the background for all of this. Um, the Jefferson School, as we see it, has expanded significantly over time. Uh, it remains the African American high school until when? 1954? 1954, what major case? Brown versus Board of Education, right? 1954, Brown versus Board of Education. The city of Charlottesville participates in what becomes called massive resistance. So we just say, no thanks. We do not, the city of Charlottesville does not integrate at schools. And in the year, uh, uh, with a federal judge in 1958, federal judge says, oh, uh, uh, yes, you are. Actually, you are going to integrate your schools. What does the city school system do? It shuts down its white schools. So there is no public education for white kids in the academic year 1958-1959. Now, the Jefferson School continues to operate. It's doing fine. Right? There's no closure of the Jefferson School. But all of the white-owned schools, or the white-occupied schools, shut down for that academic year. Except that they don't. It's in that same year that we see the establishment of the Robert E. Lee School. Note the name. We see the foundation of basically a living room and basement high, sc uh, high school, well, all schools, elementary through high schools. All of those educational processes, all of that is relocated from the public school buildings into living rooms and basements in white houses throughout the city of Charlottesville. And so there's actually set up a process whereby houses uh, proximate to one another will be a single grade, and all of the kids are going to that grade. And so for that year, they're continuing their education, but in the private residences of Charlottesville's white families. 1959 to 1960, the, all the public schools reopen. They are partially integrated except that the Robert E. Lee School continues. Uh, it is a uh, painful echo that many of Charlottesville's private schools that are in operation today are also founded in the 1970s with the closure of the Robert E. Lee School. Right? The Robert E. Lee School finally closes and uh, stops graduating students in the 1970s, and we see a robust private education system uh, uh, emerging in Charlottesville in those same decades. In 1960, the city of Charlottesville puts forward for a vote whether they should engage in urban renewal. Okay? Uh, there is a citywide vote. The choice to engage in urban renewal passes by a slim margin. But we have to recognize that that vote in 1960 is still subject to Charlottesville's poll tax. So there's a significant percentage of Charlottesville city residents that can't afford to pay the poll tax to then contribute their voice in that vote in the year 1960. Voting Rights Act of 1964 would finally make illegal poll taxes, right? So that choice to engage in urban renewal is less than a year from the final forced integration of the school system. Here's what I think history tells us about the fundamental problem, and uh, bear with me for a while because you, re you referred to the history of eugenics. Mm -hmm. uh, we could go back further to the history of our university's founding patriarch, Thomas Jefferson, mm -hmm. right? Um, and he's not unique, but I'm going to pick on him because he left us a book. He left That's us right. the notes on the slave, uh, uh, the, on the state of Virginia, and so we know this principle that I'd like to name and call dehumanization. And dehumanization of blacks is not only at the core of the explicit and blatant historical racism that you've described, 
But I'd like to suggest that dehumanization has seeped into and permeated even our understanding today. Now that might be surprising because you will not hear very many of the good white folks of Charlottesville say the kinds of things that Thomas Jefferson said about blacks. Right. Right? They right. don't love, they don't polished. grieve, right? <laughs> yeah. They're like mm -hmm. orangutans and they mm -hmm. are so many horrific things. Mm -hmm. Move that forward to the eugenics movement and how mm -hmm. this false, as you put it correctly, science mm -hmm. tried to create an inferior and superior race from a falsely scientific perspective. And that, Lewis, I would suggest is the dehumanizing fundamental belief system that operated blatantly. It fueled massive resistance. In my research, I go and I look at the files of the school boards and the letters that were written to explain why amalgamation, why blacks and whites couldn't go together. And we're still talking about a population blacks that were believed to be subhuman. Right. If it is true that what is at bottom, or at least at important part of the explanation for why these differences continue to persist is this subconscious notion that blacks are somehow different than, that I am not morally responsible for those differences. The differences have moved on, have changed. We don't see those blatant things. If that's true, then I'm gonna use my faith tradition. What we know about being a Christ follower is the key, mm -hmm. is the key to solving these puzzles. And these puzzles are not simple, right? right? But it is the key to solving the dehumanization assumption. Right? And so, when Charlottesville saw a series of events that brought the KKK unhooded, courageous and bold, many of Charlottesville's white residents were astounded, shocked. How could these people from the outside invade our peaceable city? But what that fails to recognize is that for our African American neighbors, this is yet one more eruption of a landscape of white supremacy and racialized marginalization that has been true for centuries. For the African American in Charlottesville, this is just one more chapter. Here it is again, no surprise. And so those of us that love Charlottesville and have loved Charlottesville tend to view that through pretty white eyes. And that isolation is a result of the segregation that's been inscribed in our landscape for centuries and that shape our friend networks and our social structures and our churches. And adopting that framework of celebrating the peaceable city of Charlottesville and not recognizing the legacy of white supremacy and marginalization that's been inscribed in this landscape for centuries is simply not hearing my neighbor. It's choosing deafness. And for us to jump too quickly to a language of reconciliation fails, fails the test of truth. So we can't begin to have a conversation about reconciliation until we begin to have a serious conversation about truth-telling. And that's why we as Christians are particularly responsible. If we claim to be truth-tellers, we must own this truth. Because this is who we are. This is the legacy that we've inherited. And the future of the city of Charlottesville lies on our shoulders collectively, white and black. But we can only lock arms with our black neighbors. <clears throat>
until we actually know them and know their stories. There will be no reconciliation while Charlottesville remains segregated. Because that landscape of segregation is today. That landscape of isolation and marginalization is still today. Until we do that work, table reconciliation. It's not an option. When we think about being a Christian, that is a follower of Christ, what did Christ announce his ministry as? He said, I'm anointed to preach the gospel to whom? To the poor? The recovery of sight to the blind? Freedom to prisoners? And freedom to the oppressed, right? If my tradition is Judaism, what did Isaiah tell me to? Call and cry out against injustice, right? In both of those traditions, and I dare say in others I know less well, the fundamental equality of humanity is a moral and spiritual mandate that the rest of the world needs to understand. And we have it. We are compelled to live by it. And that's motivation to have the hard conversations. Charlottesville now has an opportunity to go back and revisit dehumanization, racism, and the harms that it caused seriously and continues to cause today out of the moral mandate of love, mm -hmm. a concern for the oppressed, for the prisoners, for the poor, and for the blind. Mm -hmm. We can do that today. Mm -hmm. And that gives me a lot of hope. Mm -hmm. I'm deeply encouraged by your hope. And you know what? I'm ready to walk with you in that. Thank you so much for You're taking welcome. some time. You're welcome. Thanks for asking me. Thank you.